I used to play like fantastic in the studio. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there's the en- engineer, the producer uh, or? Yeah, yeah, the person who's uh, totally in charge, like Steve Epstein, he's called the, yeah, I guess producer. And then he said, okay, sounds good. Are you ready? I said, what? (laughs) (laughs) You didn't, you didn't do that. You didn't tape that. That was the best I've ever. (laughs) No, I mean, but do you know that feeling a little bit like uh, you're, you're kind of cool and relaxed and you do something and it's good. Mm-hmm. And then they say, "Okay, let's uh, let's get let's get started now." So you should be secretly pushing a button, I think. But no. go ahead. Well, we're recording now, and I think that I, I might Very even keep good. I might even keep all of what you said. And now my guest today is Richard Stoltzman. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> you mean you tape that? You, uh, <laughs> I, you can't say tape it anymore. What do you what do you call it? Just record, I guess. Record. Yeah. Taping sounds way, way more, it's irreplaceable tape. Yeah. Recording seems like it's gone or it's on or it's off. Eh, eh. But tape, like there it is. And you can take a razor blade and <coughs> put these two together. I, I'm, I'll never forget the first recording I did with, um, I can't remember names, but he was my, he was my producer for years and years. Um, anyway, uh, the, the first recording we did together um, was with tape, you know, mm-hmm. and this is a long time before you were born, way before. And um, then he invited me over to his apartment in in New York to hear the final thing, and um, so that was great. And I sat there, and he had a, you know, it's pretty big. Uh, a roll of tape, I mean, or uh, not roll, but uh, like two containers of tape, put it on. And then he said, now nah, you should just uh, just relax, close your eyes, you know, or something and listen. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't take his advice. I got a little more tense and I started looking at the tape recorder mm-hmm. and it, it started turning and I saw these white pieces and it was all the connections of the splicing that had been done during the, during the day of the recording. And I didn't go, but I could see, you know, it would happen like two, two, way, 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 way too many times, you know, it was, it was it, it, sort of for your ego, it was really a shock. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's why he said, okay, okay. So now will you close your eyes? <laughs> Just listen. <laughs> so when I did that, gee, I said, oh, that sounds good. And I mean, that was my f- long, long before RCA or anything. And mm-hmm. so good for me was like a compliment, you know. <laughs> but um, Max, Max Wilcox. Max Wilcox. Mm. Yeah. He was the producer, not the producer. Yeah, I guess so. I want to go back a little bit and, and talk about your passion for mathematics, because that's one thing I, and I've known about your recordings and I've known about you for many, many years, but I didn't know that you were so passionate about mathematics that you went into to school for math and music at the same time. But why math, mathematics? Uh, yeah, you know, I think it was probably, I, I uh, had luckily, everything in my life sort of happened because of great teachers. And this was a great teacher in high school. Mm. And this, in th- these days, this was in the 1950s, they actually brought a t- huge monster like TV into the room uh, for this special class of, of a bunch of us who were allowed to listen to lectures uh, from the University of uh, Cincinnati mm. on higher mathematics, it wasn't that much higher, but, but it was nothing that was being taught at the school. And uh, the teacher of the, uh, the course was actually kind of boring, mm. but um, 
our teacher who was there to watch the screen with us and then talk about it afterwards was terrific. And he made, he made all these things that, that looked on the chalkboard like, I don't know what. I don't, he made them alive, you know? It was a teacher. And uh, from that, uh, I pretty much excelled at all these things that you are not supposed to even take into college. And so um, I skipped my that re uh, requirement when I when I went to Ohio State, and so they put me in uh, an advanced class in mathematics, which was great. Um, and I I enjoyed that, but then I realized that I wanted to play the clarinet, and I uh, I just kind of drifted off from mathematics, unfortunately, because I had gotten. After, after I graduated and, uh, you know, started having a little bit of uh, reputation in music, I got a, a, a letter from one of the uh, mathematics societies asking me to give a talk to them on this combination of music and math. And I was, I, you know, humbly, I just said pretty much what I just said to you, you know, I, I loved it, but I can... But you know, in retrospect, I think there there's so many wonderful uh, crisscrossings between music and math. And um, I had a good friend, I have a good friend, uh, who is the first violinist of of the um, Borromeo Quartet, uh, Nick Kitchen, who um, was fascinated with the work of Bach and how it would it would be like almost like a beautiful math uh, solution, except it, it was all in music and in the placement of the tones and so forth. Uh, but but it, it was sort of like it gave you chills because he couldn't have known all that stuff. He, I mean, it, it wasn't yet, you know, we were, we're talking in what, 17th century or something. Uh, but the math was there, maybe even unbeknownst to Bach. It created symbolic structures that looked like sort of like the, 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 the things that were drawn on the board in high school when that math, mathematician would and you put this equal and then and you say, and here we are with the answer. Yeah? But instead of chalk, it was Bach mm. creating music that um, doesn't you don't have to know anything about math, hmm. of course, yeah, yeah, to yeah. love Bach, but but there it is in a kind of uh, it's like you don't really have to know anything about the heart; hmm. it just works. Yeah, and you, you you can accept it, but when you know what an in, incredible thing it does, you know it's kind of like overwhelming. It's, that's the way sometimes I feel with composers always, but Bach especially, it's like, ah, it's just, an, it sounds like just a, something lovely, you know, uh, or fun or danceable or something, <laughs> just, yeah. you know, and, and then when somebody brings out, teases out, or just reveals how amazingly, uh, inventive and and almost uh like architecturally great music that Bach could do or you know I saw I'm I was thinking about that um thinking about that with uh, Elliot Carter I'm work I was working on a piece a while ago it was it's a uh, called Pastoral mm. Um, but nobody ever plays it. He wrote it for English horn, but then, uh, you know, a publisher said, we, we, let's, let's also give some other instruments the possibility of mm. using this and, uh, you know, maybe we'll sell some more. So um, it was in 1945, um, but he wrote it primarily in five. Mm. Uh, and it never sounds good. Nobody plays it and I can understand why. But if you start to feel it as a as a as a jazz piece, as an improvisation, not not to say you're, you're going to have uh, Dave Brubeck, Dave Brubeck going on, <laughs> like 
No, no, it's not. But it gives life to the piece, which otherwise becomes, for most performers, uh, a kind of a cha challenge mathematically to make it all fit together. And uh, so I started having fun with this as an improvisation, and it really helped me a lot. And actually, that's only because um, I told uh, uh, Carter, uh, Mr. Mr. Carter, when he was still alive, that um, I had played a composition of his called Gra, which was like 50 years later, he wrote in the 1990s. And it's very strange piece, pretty much 12 tone, but not. And, but at any rate, he, um, I, he, I, I told him, you know, this is one of the only pieces I play where the audience smiles afterwards. And he said, ah, that's what a composer wants to hear. Th that was a strange reaction. I thought, you know, I thought my, he might be offended, but he loved it. And I started fooling around with his piece and I realized that it was five pages long. It dealt with 12 tone series and it divided time into groups of five mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways. Um, and both musically and, and of, of course, uh, mathematically. Uh, but because he said, that's what a composer wants to hear, that some, it makes you smile. I started thinking about, he must be doing like something to make us smile with all of this. And sure enough, sure enough, he was using those, the, the idea of five to present um, little like almost chess games and um, uh, crossword puzzles and uh, plays on on words or, or on musical terms that really struck me. And what also knocked me out was when I realized that he had written on in his five pages more espressivo. Yeah. Molto espressivo. Molto espressivo. Molto espressivo. The first page has like five of those, you know, molto espressivo. And what's going on? You, you can't at, at, the, at the beginning understand why, why is he asking us to play espressivo? We're, we're trying to play, you know, we're trying to figure out this problem, these mathematical things, the fives and all that, and, and make it work and play the right notes. And it's all 12 tone. Is it? Ah. And it's, but in the middle of all these, uh, he kept saying, with expression, with expression, with expression. <laughs> yeah. And this, it really got to me to the point where I started thinking, you know what? I think this should be played like a jazz piece. Because when you play, when you play any piece of jazz that's written out, there, there's never like play with expression. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a tempo and then there's, there's your chart. And you work on it, but you know where it's coming from, mm -hmm. and so you immediately are in your your uh, your mode of mm -hmm. opening up, of expressing yourself mm -hmm. in the music and everything. Which you, if you're a jazz player, that's it. Uh, I mean, you can obey, I guess, the composer's, you know, little not dot dots and night nice things but the, mostly you hear the expression of the performer and i think that's what he might have been me i mean he died before i got to ask that but why so many espressivos in this very mathematically you know and way uh, not just students but you know performers work on it is as some kind of terrible mathematical problem that you've got to figure out all these things but maybe it's just Maybe he's just saying, play it like jazz. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, I was going to ask you about jazz because some of the greatest players I've had the honor of uh, having Sharon Isbin, who's a guitarist, and Evelyn Glennie, who's a percussionist on, mm -hmm. and both of them and you have not been afraid to... Uh, 
collaborate with jazz artists, with pop artists and other <laughs> genres. What, what, what inspires you? Because it also could be scary because sometimes the classical music world can be judgmental. Um, uh, what, what inspires you to just go for it and do these collaborations that other people might be afraid to do or not have the skills to do it? Yeah, I wouldn't say sometimes, I'd say almost always. The classical world is judgmental. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, maybe if I, I start back um, with um, hearing my dad play the tenor saxophone in the kitchen mm -hmm. in the 1940s and um, trying to sound like Lester Young because my father's name was Leslie mm -hmm. and he loved when people called him Lester because that made him feel like, yeah, that's, that's who I really am. You know, I mean, he was a businessman, he wasn't a jazz player, but he would play these tones and play after these, uh, these licks, you know, of Ben Webster and, and Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young records, just 78 records. Um, and so I, that's how I heard music. I mean, that's what music was, I was hearing was my dad, playing on these riffs and mostly trying not to, well, he wanted to play exactly what he heard, but he just wanted to get the sound. He wanted to get the sound. The sound was most important to him. And I mean, I didn't think any of this stuff. I was playing with rolled up, rolled up newspapers underneath the kitchen table. You know. But it, it, I, I, tribute what you're saying about me and, and uh, improvisation and jazz to that experience, I think, mm. uh, with a parent, with my father, and, and doing this improvisation. I didn't think, it, just, you know, playing this and playing it for enjoyment yeah. and playing for sound. Well, if you were to look back at your career, which you've done so many things, what would you say is a life-changing moment musically? And uh, past artists have come up and said, oh, you know, it's really tough to just say one li uh, life-changing moment. So you're welcome to say a couple of big moments in your life that really changed things. And also maybe a personal life-changing moment that has nothing to do with music. I think um, this was not a moment that changed my life, but uh, it was the fact that my both my parents sang in choir mm. and, and I didn't think anything about it. That's what you're supposed to do if you go to church, you sing in the choir. My dad was a tenor, my mother was an alto. And um, the alto section, nothing against my mom, but it was weak. And my dad got this idea that um, when I started learning the clarinet and I started to, um, you know, be able to play some notes that I should come to the rehearsal and just sit with the, the, the couple of ladies in the alto section and play their part with them. So that doesn't sound like a significant moment, but in retrospect, first of all, I didn't know from transposition. Mm -hmm. All I knew is that dots, on, if they go up, you're supposed to raise your fingers up. You, dots, you would put your fingers down. So how, how could I play? I mean, I didn't even analyze this until much later, but I realized I had to use my ear. Aha. <laughs> like I had to listen in order to play music. Not, not this, this stuff didn't, wouldn't have helped me. So that was one thing. And the second thing, of that, which was sort of a revelation, but way in the future, was that you had to make your sound with singing. That's, if you're going to be an alto, you had to sing the song of the altos or whatever, you know? You had to do that. And um, I hadn't really, I had some wonder, I, tons of great, not tons, but I had many terrific clarinet teachers, but singing was not something that was uh, brought to my attention for a while. Not, not certainly when I was in like fifth grade. Um, and so retrospectively, I think, wow, this was an amazing thing that happened to me. First of all, that I was playing the clarinet thinking I was reading notes, but actually just using my ear. And secondly, 
that I was trying to imitate the voice. Mm. That's how I was, I was trying to imitate the voice. So that's one thing that I can, can transpose to my whole life mm. in terms of, of uh, where my life went. Wow. Um, and that thing about jazz, uh, I think uh, that it was a incremental, incremental thing, but the, the moment that I think empowered me in a way that I don't think I would have if, if I hadn't had that was hearing my dad would take me in the summers uh, to Eden Park in Cincinnati. Um, they, had, they had like a grass, uh, like amphitheater, like an amphitheater, but just grass. And I'd hear every Sunday these, these sort of falling apart buses climb the hill up to the park. <laughs> and they get there around like you know one o'clock in the afternoon and you'd see the bus door open and these like creatures from some other planet would come out they had like they all had like dark glasses on they just looked like they'd been unnecessarily awakened from something probably they were and they get out and you know pretty haggard looking they had suits and ties but not very and this was the band this was uh woody herman's band this was les brown's band this was um well i heard i heard a lot of different bands big bands and um very very um not exciting at mm -hmm. the beginning getting off the bus seeing them assemble kind of assemble pulling their horns out of their cases and blowing a couple of notes. Then they'd get on the stand. Mm. <sighs> sort of like, okay, all right, it's one o'clock. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> but they get out, you know, and they get their horns ready. And then whoever was a band band guy would <laughs> one, two, yeah. one. It's like, you know, I'm sitting with my dad. I didn't know what to expect. And there's these be tremendous surges of power and sound and emotion and, and thrilling rhythmic drive. And, you know, and I remember also retrospectively, because someone had asked me that later on about what affected me. And I just remembered that if I ever was lucky enough or got good enough or something to play music, that's the way I want to play music. I want to play it with that kind of emotion, that kind of power, that kind of fierce, like intensity, but also um, um, like into the world with it, like playing to all these people who are just on the grass, kind of, you know, having a nice time. And um, so th those two, those are very early uh, life-changing things. I have other life-changing things, but I, I remember those uh, so fondly. That's amazing. Well, you have two duos. One is with your wife and one is with your son. How is it uh, to have a duo with a family member? Is, to tell me the, the, the positives and negatives, maybe. <laughs> oh, I can't think. Well, you know, oh, I. I could think of, I'm not going to go into the negative, but, <laughs> but um, you know, with my son, it was a little bit like me with my dad. He heard me practice. And in fact, that's what he thought I did. Mm. And I remember my daughter's was in fourth grade. Uh, uh, the teacher asked, what does your father do? And she said, well, he goes in the basement. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> a teacher called up. Is it, your daughter just said you go to the basement. <laughs> oh, she means I practice. But I, but I you know, the teacher said, well, I was, we were talking about what your dad does for a living, what your fathers do for a living. And I said, I think my daughter thinks that's what I do for a living. <laughs> I practice because you never, you know, she hadn't gone to a concert or anything like that. So um, that was a stun stunner, you know, to think that your, your daughter thought 
what your job was, was to go in the basement and practice. But my son was a little older and he started um, listening to music and found, he found his outlets, the music that appealed to him. And, and so, we, okay, let's take, get piano lessons. And he, he did that for a while, but he was kind of not, um, you know, he liked baseball and sports and stuff like that. Luckily, he, had a t he got a teacher. His first teacher was great, but then he kind of outgrew her and got this guy who had the wisdom to see that he was not capturing my son really in any kind of vital way. And he said, why don't you, this was a, in Cambridge, and he said, we got this cement court out here where you play basketball, bring, it, bring your basketball you know, before the lesson. Or we'll just have a short lesson and play basketball. Great. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, he's, he's totally, I, I want to go to my panel. I want to, you know. And um, that was a very wise move on, on the part of his piano teacher and kept him involved in a way that wouldn't have. And mm -hmm. then he got one summer at um, the great summer school for kids. Uh, anyway, the, it's a, the kids are immersed in music the entire day, and they're all kind of good. And but they also have room for sports, and so he found out that there, there were these piano players who were incredible, but they also played ping pong. Mm -hmm. And that changed him. And so then he became a pianist. He said, okay, I, I can relate to that. And uh, how we started out playing together was I just wanted him to play something with me. And we, you know, but it, it turned out he was an improviser. So mm. he could do uh, way more than just play tunes. Mm. And uh, he got better and better. And... Um, really way beyond me. And um, so uh, I, I was very lucky mm. that he stayed with it and, and was willing to go on the stage with me. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, um, it, I, it, this is what he's doing. Mm. And is it Blue Lake? Is it the Blue Lake camp? No, it's, um, it's all, all year long. It's an institution that has a, like a, four-year curriculum even oh, okay is that interlocken uh, yeah interlocken yeah yeah Great. Okay. yeah oh i like you <laughs> interlocken. that was it and and you know and then of course he did berkeley and um but for him berkeley was a place to meet people mm -hmm. mostly um and then he found his teachers sort of on the side mm -hmm. and uh you know this, the, he was a great guy because he hung out with me. Mm. I was on the road all the time. You know, I probably saw my daughter maybe three or four times a year wow. until she was, uh, you know, in school. Mm. But, but Pete would come with me. Yeah. Well, touring life is tough. Uh, I had I had Ransom Wilson on, flute player, uh, on my podcast, and he talked about how he really struggled with it at times. And he talked about Jean Pierre Ron Paul, who was more capable of touring and doing the whole thing. What was what's so tough about the touring life, other than maybe not seeing family? I'm sure there are a lot of things most people could think about, but what was tough for you? What was difficult touring, if anything? Well, I, you know, when you're in it. It's just, especially at a certain certain age, I was in my 20s and everything, it, 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, I guess, maybe 50s actually too. <laughs> I toured, I toured my whole life. Um, what was your question? Like, you mean, what, what's, what was what, what, what is What's difficult about touring so, so much when you don't see family and all that? What's, what's difficult about it? Well, I mean, the seeing the family is difficult mostly for the family member who stays home yeah. and has to deal with it. Yeah. And I didn't. 
So um, this is a, I don't know what you want to call it, cross I have to bear or a responsibility that I, this is why my son didn't, uh, he, he got some tremendous offers early in his career to go on the road. And one, he called me up and said, dad, this is so, so, and I said, oh man, this is it. He said, no, I told him I'm not gonna do it. What? What? This is it. You're gonna be too, man, you're gonna, people are gonna hear you. I'm just gonna stay home. I got my son and me. Wow. Yeah, that's tough. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. He, he, with, without, without like, um, you know, killing me, he said, there's some things you did great, dad, but father part, no. <laughs> and you know, it was a very, very illuminating thing for me to, to hear him uh, decide that this, he wanted to have his family, not mm -hmm. have it, not just make it, but have it. Mm -hmm. And, and, make it part of his life wow so, so that that was the wisdom of 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 peter but um the 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 touring thing it, you know i i was lucky um in the very beginning to have the tashi group and the four of us we had a great time touring um and we were in the car all the time talking you know so we had a a kinship and a, and a kind of camaraderie uh, for at least 10 years of doing um, stuff together and telling stories together and making our, our own um, uh, not history, sort of cu cultural history. Together. How, and that was, you know, can't describe exactly, but um, I wouldn't be who I am whatever I am without the Tashi group mm. with Ida mm. and Fred and Peter. And I named Peter after uh, my son after Peter. So, oh, wow. so um, that uh, made the touring days uh, uh, legendary, not legendary. What's the word? Um, like uh, instead of being full of, problems and distressful moments and terrible concerts and food that was horrible and and delayed flights and all these things it was all we were all experiencing this together and and um it, it was like it, it was great for our morale and it was great for our our uh it was great for our ensemble mm. because we weren't just like together to play the music we were together to make the music and to take it to people. And that was a super thing. So um, without, without the group from those first many years, I think it would have been, yeah. Because then, then I started playing more just orchestras, you know, yeah. and solo things. Um, and that's, uh, that's lonely, yeah. that's lonely because you, you, in fact, you, you, you find yourself just staying in a hotel room. You're staying like going down the basement. You stay in hotel and practice, you know, and make sure you don't get sick, and and be sure you eat food that's gonna not uh, introduce itself, you know, after the after the first uh, movement, so to speak, of Definitely. the concerto, and um, yeah, I you know I I guess I I, I had some fun. <laughs> But the most fun I had was when, when my son and, and even my daughter came with me. And then of course, when, when Mika, huh. you mentioned, mm -hmm. when she, when she married me and when she, as a, as a musician, uh, was interested in trying to do uh, duos together. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I never really thought of duos other than a pianist accompanist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, which is a, not really a good word yeah. <laughs> um but so so we started uh, playing together first at home and then uh she had much you know she's like over 20 years younger than i am <laughs> which is great 
because she understands about the computer. She understands about context. She knows how to meet people. She knows how to work things out, you know, and make, make things alive on the so-called internet. I shouldn't say so-called, it is, but whatever. <laughs> it wasn't to me. It still isn't. I'm sorry. I'm, we're lucky that I got all this stuff. To, to say. I've got a computer that Mika, Mika said, don't use your computer, man. It's so old. And I said, it's fine. It always opens up. And I, <laughs> but um, so she reinvented me as a duo partner uh, and with repertoire, which she's constantly commissioning. Uh, one of my the greatest things was a friend of mine, William Thomas McKinley, great jazz player and, and a fantastic composer who wrote, well, believe it or not, he wrote five concertos for me mm. and other works for me with orchestra. And then pretty much for every ensemble I ever played in, he wrote a piece. Uh, and he wrote, we, we asked him to, uh, write a blues piece mm -hmm. for us. And, um, but we said, just, you know, we don't have much money. We, most we, we can give is like $500. So just like a couple minutes, you know, that would be great. Mm -hmm. So he, he works fast and about two weeks later, he brought over 22, we call them mostly blues, all duos, duets for clarinet and, <laughs> and marimba. We play them all the time now, all the time. Yeah. Um, and it was just a gesture of love on his part, but it, you know, we recorded them and stuff. And the other guy who really helped us out was Bill Douglas. Bill was a classmate of mine at Yale and uh, <clears throat> he became a, a terrific composer and, and pianist and, and uh, musician. And so he wrote pieces for us too. And actually several other people, John Zorn, who's a great, yeah. New York composers, he's written three things for us. Um, so we're, we're sort of building a repertoire which is be, between us and 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 makes us, um, Mika and me, um, into a, uh, it, well, it's made me into a, a new generation hmm. of, you know, because I'm, I probably would, if I hadn't met Mika, I think I'd still be down in the basement doing my practice. <laughs> So, and we tour, and, and she speaks Japanese, so we've gone to J Japan several times and played oh, wow. things. So that's that's a trip, and that was very lucky. Yeah, to me. Uh, we talked so much about music. I want to get some information about you, and that your fans don't know, your followers don't know, uh, hobbies, things that you do that most people don't know, but you're willing to share with us. Uh oh. <laughs> Oh my God, hobbies. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, um, one thing I, I, I've sort of kept going is cooking mm -hmm. and um, especially desserts. Mm -hmm. And while I was my many decades on the road, um, I had uh, like, I think maybe almost three weeks in London and, um, but I only had three concerts and I knew what I was playing. I didn't have to go to the basement and practice. And, um, you know, I did the, the, I'd seen the sites sort of, and I was thinking, what else am I going to do? And so I was on, uh, it was Marleybourne Lane, which is a cross street from Wigmore. I was playing the concerts at Wigmore, Wigmore Hall. Mm -hmm. And so I wandered down Marleybourne Lane and I saw a dessert sh shop and I had a nice piece of dessert and there was a little card on the table that said, um, if you enjoy these pastries, please uh, visit us. Us was the Cordon Bleu of, of uh, London. Mm. And their, their school mm. was like 10 meters, I should say, right? 10 meters away. Mm -hmm. So I strolled down there and I explained to the lady at the desk that I was a musician and I was staying at the, around the corner and I'm here for like three weeks and, and, you know, sort of curious about, I know this is a good school and how much would it cost for me to um, enroll, you know, but just for a minimum, say two weeks or something like that. And she told me, I said, well, that's not bad. Um, 
She said, well, it's, it's fine. You, you have to be here at you know, 8 o'clock in the morning every day. And the chef comes and gives his uh, lecture and shows you the, the, the certain methods that you're going to learn. And then you take a break and you go into the kitchens and the kitchens are like, there's something like 10 kitchens, two people at a stand and, a, and a, almost like a guard who walked up and down, but he, of course he had a toque on and everything and watched out that how you were doing your things was wow. done correctly. Even to the point, I remember I was like whipping something up you know and the, and the guy came and the chef came over and pu pushed my elbow up like this you know what 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 that what is that about and he didn't even say much except it's better and i've si si ever since i realized wow it is if you're going to whip up cream or you know whatever you're going to 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 swish around you raise your elbow instead of like this, you get the action that you want. I mean, that's just, but a lot of things, anyway, it was fun for me and completely de away from the music. And um, I got the bug and I just started, when I, when I came home, I started acquiring some, you know, equipment and recipes and started experimenting. And, and I, ever since I've, been like a dessert kind of person. Wow. It's, it's crazy because I like I would do benefits for orchestras auctioning my desserts. That's awesome. And doing, doing classes for the people who gave the most money to, to the <laughs> this orchestra and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but, but it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was great. That, that hobby has stayed with me and still is still with me. Mm. Um, no, I'm not, not too many other things. Uh, any sports? Uh, I know uh, from what I understand, you're a baseball fan. Yeah, that's because of my son. Okay, okay. Yeah, when we, when we, we moved to Boston, he was just exactly at the year when the Red Sox were about, supposedly, to win the World Series for the first time. Well, it didn't happen and he couldn't believe it. I remember he was videotaping it and he kept playing it over and over the last game. And I said, Peter is not going to change, man. It's that's, he missed the ball. It went underneath his legs. That's it. He couldn't, he just, oh, look at that again. And again, and again, you know. So, um, but his enthusiasm rubbed off on me because I remember him looking at the newspaper and, and he'd go, and <laughs> you know, stuff like that. What are you reading? And I look over, just numbers, you know, all, a whole page of numbers, and, you know, and stats. Yeah. I just looked and what are you doing? What is this? He said, dad, this is baseball. And he, of course he was right. It is all about stats. Yeah. And so that, that, that was a, enough to keep me occupied uh, in terms of um, being not informed, but uh, wanting to be informed uh, as a baseball fan, and other than that, I'm a I'm a nerd. I think <laughs> with great musicians like you who have done so much for the musical world, it's always great to get some advice for young musicians and maybe just some of what you would like to tell them. And and maybe, since some of them are struggling with a career, especially in this situation with COVID nineteen, what what advice would you give them? Yeah. Music comes um, from inside. And for musicians, classical musicians, say, the, what you have on the inside is magnified and realized through the manuscripts or printed, the, the music that you see on the music stand. And pretty much your whole life is going to be lifting those 
abstract, mostly notations off the page and transfer them to your, your heart and let them be there pretty much for, for your whole life and use the music to, you know, to heal people. People who can't play or don't know anything about music, people all need to be touched and need to just have that moment. And that you, you can touch people with music. You don't have to touch people, but your music will touch and you won't know who they are. And you won't, may not even know exactly why they are touched, moved, uh, changed. But if your chosen profession is to be a musician, it's probably the highest calling you, you uh, can accept. I mean, I think, you know, medicine and, uh, and healers and religions, those are pretty high callings too, but music is universal in a way that we don't technically understand, but we understand because of, of that heart connection. And in order to do that, kind of your mundane job is to is to um, put your breath or your, as a clarinet player anyway, put your breath into that instrument and make the sound that you hear in, in, in your head come alive. And this is like uh, not something to do occasionally. It's every time you go, and you start your read vibrating, this is almost, I'd say, enough. Wow. Um, last question. Is that question. too heavy? That, no, that's great. That's great. Well, no, I, uh, uh, every, every person, this is the great thing about, about some of these amazing artists that I've had the honor of um, talking to on this podcast is that everyone has their own way of sharing uh, something from their life to the young musicians, which I think is very important. So ev everyone has some kind of a um, contribution to these young musicians, which I think is fantastic. Uh, you've collaborated with some great artists, you know, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, Judy Collins, you know, all these diverse artists from all over the place. Um, what's what's a, a collaboration that stands out for whatever reason it might be, a, you know, whether it's a composer or, or some of those collaborators, what's a, a collaboration that stands out that was very special to you, if any? Oh, no, too many. Okay. Too, too many. Um, but just starting early in my life, the, the collaboration um, with uh, Bill Douglas, mm -hmm. uh, we went to school at, at Yale together and then he went on to uh, do music. And I remember having sort of way too much time uh, at the California Institute of the Arts because I think I maybe had two students. <laughs> and um, we would spend days and nights and days and nights and days and nights listening and playing music. And Bill was the man who made me listen to um, things like Elliot Carter and Theolonius Monk and um, John, John Coltrane and Bach uh, as all essential and all not only worthwhile, but all um, necessary to stay alive, mm. to be in yourself. And his, his just being my friend and colleague for the four years that I was at the California Institute of the Arts uh, pretty much formed what I think about in terms of playing music. His, his, his one exasperating, wonderfully exasperating comment to me usually was when we were playing a piece through usually a simple piece 
She says, no, Dick, that's great. That's, that's great. But can, can you be more poignant? And nobody ever, I mean, no clarinet teacher ever says, can you play more poignant? I mean, it's just not a word that seems to have necessary. I mean, can you play this more correctly? <laughs> you know, can you uh, play it more loud or softer? <laughs> but poignant? It's hard to even find music from and composers where the word poignant is used as a way of making the music understood more. So, but his, I'll never forget. Well, I haven't forgotten that word. And so um, it cut into me in a way that uh, has separated me from a lot of stuff that I shouldn't be concerned about. But, you know, that's, Bill is, is one kind of unique guy that Tom McKinley, William Thomas McKinley, my God, the, the incredible creative force that he had in my life. He wrote music for every combination of instruments that I ever played with, from orchestras to choirs, mm -hmm. to Tashi, to uh, viola, uh, clarinet, uh, piano, duo, trios. Uh, and, uh, this wow. is an unbelievable, a great thing. And he passed away, but, but he was huge in my determination to play new music and to play music that I couldn't, mm -hmm. but keep doing it. Wow. Um, I think, you know, those two guys are my close buddy kind of, of people, but, but um, there were a lot of people in my life that, that affected me, I, I have to say, Benny Goodman. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you're, you don't even know who he is, but... Of course I know Benny Goodman. I, I mean, I, of course I know the name Benny Goodman. Really? Yeah, of I, course. I, I don't... Well, okay, I believe you, but... You know, I mean, when I was a child, that was the, uh, not a name I understood, uh, except my grandmother took me to see the Benny Goodman story. Mm. And uh, when I was like six or seven or something like that, and uh, I saw, you know, it's a big screen and everything. I saw the, clar the clarinet, which I had just decided I wanted to play. There it was like 35 feet high and, and everything was the Benny. And um, I, I kept that inside of me <laughs> until, I guess, I, I guess probably until the day I went to see him at his penthouse. And I very vividly remember this special elevator that only went to the penthouse. Mm. So I got on it, small little bit, and went up to see, personally, Benny Goodman. Mm. And I opened. I remember it, it, I rang the bell, he opened the door, and I, I just was stunned and shocked. I, I thought all the way going up in the elevator about my experience of Benny Goodman. My dad loved Benny Goodman's music, blah, blah, blah. And then I, you know, I looked at and I, that's not Benny Goodman. And I just realized I was expecting to see Steve Allen. Mm -hmm. Steve Allen starred in the Benny Goodman film mm. that I saw when I was a little kid. Steve Allen, he, I mean, he's passed away, but anyway, he was the actor who played Benny Goodman. And that's all I knew about Benny Goodman is that he, Steve Allen. And then suddenly there was the actual, the real Benny Goodman. And he was great, great to me. And he influenced me in certain, I mean, he came to my first Carnegie Hall concert, which was like incredible. And, and, uh, I don't know if you want to hear the little story, but he, oh, yeah. he was in the balcony, you know, and I said, this is an amazing moment for me, you know, playing the first concert in Carnegie Hall for clarinet, but more amazing as a clarinet player is that Benny Goodman is, a, you know, and because at that time people really knew Benny Goodman uh -huh. and, and he was in the balcony. He had a, like a special balcony thing. They got a spotlight on him and we, everybody, <laughs> With more more clapping than my whole concert. Oh yeah, great. But of course, you know the clarinet is made up has like five parts that are stuck together. Mm -hmm. And as I was clapping with my hands, the, <laughs> it just wiggled out of my hands. I was looking up at Benny. Everybody was looking up at Benny, and suddenly I heard thunk, and I looked over. Here's the Carnegie Hall stage, and my clarinet is like 
rolling <laughs> towards the edge of this half of my clarinet. It's going to, my my pianist is having a heart attack because she saw that, you know, and I just scuttled over there in my tails and grabbed it up and put it back together. And, you know, and she says, is it working? I said, I hope, I don't know. But that was my experience with a, a really, really famous a, a person in, in a very famous concert hall stage. And the only thing I was concerned about was my clarinet rolling across you see, nobody else even noticed. In fact, somebody, I said, what, what about that one I dropped? And they said, I don't know. We were looking at Benny and we didn't see him. That's awesome. Well, Benny Goodman, um, most people, those who know him, know him as a jazz, more, more of a jazz classical uh, totally. uh, jazz player. But my first experience with Benny Goodman or even listening to him is I bought a bunch of these old records and I was just going through them listening and I get to a Mozart clarinet concerto. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking it might be you or someone else on the record. So I open the record. I see it's Benny Goodman and I could not believe it. I search his name. It says jazz player. I'm like, it's definitely not him. They made a mistake. But then I did some more research. I realized it's Benny Goodman playing a uh, Mozart clarinet concerto. So yeah. The, the first time I played uh, Mozart clarinet concerto in Carnegie Hall, he sent me a telegram. Hmm. <laughs> and yeah. It's just, tell, this is the days when you got telegrams backstage, knock, 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 telegram. I looked at it. It's from B. Goodman. Hmm. So I opened it up and it said, don't forget what key it's in. I thought, that, that's really a great telegram. Yeah. Because Benny, you know, he played the B-flat clarinet his whole life. Uh -huh. But he had to play the A clarinet for the Mozart concerto. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he wanted to remind me, as a fellow clarinet player, that I shouldn't bring my B-flat clarinet out on the stage when I have to play the A clarinet. <laughs> so it was sweet. And what, what it really did for me was completely wipe out my being nervous mm. for this you know, event of playing the concerto in Carnegie Hall. Don't forget what key it's in. Yeah, yeah. You know, like get get your head together and play. It was, it was really good. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This is, yeah, this is great. A lot of amazing stories, uh, very inspirational. It's been an honor having you. Hopefully, hopefully one day we could do this in person. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.